Um, that's what's so important. Good afternoon, friends and newcomers to our Friday special conversations with special people. I'm so happy to introduce our very special guest today, John Gresser, author and senior research scholar at Sam Houston State University and visiting fellow at A&M University in Texas. And you're in Texas, but your home is in South Orange and your talks here at the library have been phenomenal. Everyone knows more about what you have written and about this wonderful Edgar Allan Poe, the author. Um, you first spoke here on October 31st, 2013 on the topic, Eat My Shorts, The Life, Literature and Legacy of Edgar Allan Poe. And for people who didn't understand what Eat My Shorts were, they were watching the cartoon, the television one. Um, John's last book, Edgar Allan Poe and his 19th century counterparts, we purchased for our library collection. And now his most recent book is Hager's Daughter, the story of Southern caste prejudice. And we're hoping to be able to get that too. Um, today's talk is young readers in Edgar Allan Poe. And I can't wait to hear it. Well, I've learned so much, not only about Edgar Allan Poe, when you did the book on the, Where the Crawdash Sing, and you did every, all of your talks are fabulous, and I appreciate it very much that from Texas that you're doing it. So please let us give a big applause to our special and wonderful guest, John Gusser. Thank you, Phyllis. You're, you're terrific setting all these, uh, all these programs up. And uh, thanks to all of you for, for you. joining us. Greetings uh, from Texas. Uh, very warm weather yesterday it was warm enough as I was telling Phyllis and Michael that I could go swimming outside. But today it is cold and rainy, but we don't have snow the way you do. Uh, what I'm going to do is share my screen because I have a slideshow. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Can you see that? that says it, Edgar. Most people, yes. are on their phone. Most people are on their phone. Yes, I can see it. Okay. All right. Uh, I just want to make sure that it's going to advance. Yep. Okay. So I, I thank Phyllis for asking me to do this. I, I really learned a lot about this topic, a lot of things that, uh, that, that I didn't know. So uh, let me give, give you an overview. Um, the five things that I want to talk about. Number one, I want to try and explain Poe's to young readers. Number two, I want to talk about the relationship between Poe and children's education after 1850. Now, Poe died under mysterious circumstances in 1849. So this is after he, he has died. Uh, the thing I want to talk about is Poe and magazines for juvenile readers. What I want to talk about is Poe and films comic books and cartoons. And finally, I wanna talk about his story, The Gold Bug, which was staggeringly popular, although it's not that as popular today, but also some problems connected with The Gold Bug. Okay, so let's start with the reasons for Poe's having such great appeal to young readers. First reason has to do with genre, the kind of literature that he wrote and the subject, what he wrote about. It's the kind of thing that, that young people are, are fascinated with. Second thing is the, the typical length of his works, kind of perfect for young readers. He also had uh, this theory or, or this kind of rule, a dictum about uh, one setting, which I'll explain. And then we'll get into it at some length, Poe's connection to uh, children's education. So let's Let's begin with, with the, the kinds of literature that Poe wrote and the subject matter. So Poe invented modern detective fiction. Think about it, without detective fiction, there's no Dora the Explorer. There's no Scooby-Doo. It all goes back to Poe in some way. In addition, uh, although he didn't invent horror fiction or what's sometimes called the Gothic, he, he definitely um, took it to, to great heights in the, in the short story form. He wrote uh, early science fiction, 
and he was a great influence on the French writer Jules Verne. That's all prose. But in addition, of course, Poe was a poet. Yes, and a lot true. of his poems are about lost loves, often teenage or young adult lovers. Um, and a lot of his other poems are about kind of dreamlands rather than specific locations. And Can we make these lower? Tend, to, tend to appeal to uh, young readers. Okay, now I want to move on to this length. Poe wrote mostly uh, short stories and short poems. He had a couple of long poems and he wrote one novel. But of the 100 poems that he wrote, most of them are short. And the vast majority of his fiction is what we would call short stories today. And this reflects his critical beliefs because he believed that um, what a, an author should try and do is to produce the greatest effect. So he believed that everything within a work of literature should contribute to that overall effect that the author is going for. He also thought for this, for the, for the author to have the most profound effect, that it had to be short enough, the literary text, to be read in one setting. So you had to be able to read it in two hours or less. So again, this is perfect for young readers. It's perfect for texts, yes. short stories, short stone, the short uh, short poems. Okay, let's move on now to my second major topic, which is Poe and youth education. There were a lot of changes that took place, changes related to audience, changes related to Poe's biography and changes related to children's education itself. So let me begin with audience. Poe did not write for children. He wrote for magazines. Now, one possible connection is that a lot of the people who were reading magazines in the first half of the 19th century um, were newly literate. I mean, there were, there were more literate people certainly in the 19th century than there had been in the 18th century in the United States and the colonies before that. But the very concept of adolescence and then that adolescent literature, this was something new. This didn't really come to, to into people's thoughts until the 19th century, really until almost the mid 19th century. Um, but when there was, a, when, there was uh, when textbooks were being produced, Editors needed content, content that would appeal to ch children and that was deemed to be appropriate for children. And they turned to Poe, as I will talk about. Second thing has to do with Poe's biography. Unfortunately for Poe, he died under, in more ways than one, he died under mysterious kind of notorious circumstances. He was found um, incoherent in front of a polling place that also happened to be a tavern in Baltimore, wearing clothes that were clearly not his. He was taken to a hospital and he died three or so days later, never really gaining consciousness again. Worse than that for Poe, the man who was his literary executor, someone by the name of Rufus Griswold, defamed Poe. He, he, he wrote biographies of Poe. He rushed out a collected editions of Poe's work. And he, he wrote a memoir, but really a biography of Poe, which contained out and out lies, saying that Poe was a drug addict, that he was immoral. Um, Griswold went so far as to rewrite some of Poe's correspondence to make it look like he was a bad person. So initially, after Poe dies, he's regarded as an immoral person and as a weak person connected with alcoholism and connected with these lies of Griswold. But in the second half of the 19th century, this changed. His reputation soared. He was embraced abroad, first in France, um, by, Charles, by, uh, by Charles Baudelaire, who translated a lot of his works, and by the symbolist poets. Um, the defamatory airs from Griswold that were repeated 
in the 1850s and 1860s, these were slowly corrected so that by the end of the 19th century, there was a very different Edgar Allan Poe who emerged. And he was, he was being regarded as, as, a, as a major American writer. And certainly by the time of, of uh, the, his 100th birthday, um, in 1909, there were all sorts of celebrations of Poe. So that by the end of the 19th century, Poe went from being this immoral, weak person to this model that children should emulate, a model for writing poetry and for poems. <laughs> okay, so this was something I wasn't aware of. There was no compulsory education in the United States before 1850, so during Poe's lifetime. The first state to pass a law requiring children to go to school was Massachusetts in 1852. And thereafter, many other states followed. Well, there, there were, of course, private schools before that. But you know, the, with, with the advent of all of these public schools, there was a great need for textbooks. Now, how was Poe used in schools and in textbooks? Well, really in three ways. First, as training in the art of reading and literary analysis. So his works were reprinted, students would be required to read them, and then they would have to talk about them in an intelligent way. A second way in which, a second way in which uh, Poe's uh, were in refining elocutionary skills. Um, it, it was, there was a real premium placed on being able to speak clearly and distinctly, being able to, pronunci to pronunciate things properly, to be able to speak with sufficient volume, emphasis, and speed. And those of you who can, who can see my slide here, you see this man who's actually shaping a young woman's mouth. To, to, to get her to enunciate properly. And, and particularly in schools for, for young women, there was a real stress on these elocutionary skills. Finally, Poe's works were used in textbooks because, and in schools, because children like them. They, they provided entertainment and the philosophy as it is today. If you, if you, can, you can give students something that they're interested in reading, they're likely to read it and they're likely to, to really be focused on it. Um, and also, Poe had these, with detective fiction and other things, he had a lot of very ingenious examples that, uh, that uh, appealed to, to young readers. Okay, if you're a textbook editor, you're going to make certain decisions. You're going to uh, delete things, um, maybe for space reasons, but you may delete things because of, of the content may not be to be appropriate for, for young readers. Um, the other thing you might do as an editor is to, um, is to gloss certain things, to, to offer footnotes. So the first footnote of one of Poe's literary works was for The Raven. This is when it was published in a textbook in 1855. And you know, those of you who are familiar with Poe, he's got an incredible vocabulary. I remember when I was a teenager, I spent a whole summer trying to, uh, trying to get through the complete Edgar Allan Poe. I didn't make it, but I got pretty close. But one of the reasons it took me so long is I was looking up so many words. So Nepenthe is a, is a kind of drug or something which, um, which causes people to be for, for, forgetful. So that was the one word that was lost in an 1855 textbook. By the time The Raven was published in 1867, there were 26 footnotes for the Raven. Okay, let me talk about Poe's texts in specific uh, books that were used in schools. So I don't know how well known the Bells is today. Bells is a great poem, it's a, it's a rather long poem, um, but it, it's, it's based on the yearly cycle and also on the life cycle. And it's really a, an experiment in sound. So Poe talks about um, the different stages of life and the bells that go along with it. So it begins in childhood with the Christmas bells. It then moves on to young adulthood with the wedding bells. 
then moves on to, um, I guess it would be middle age and the, the fire bell, some sort of danger or emergency. And it ends with old age and, and the funeral bells. Um, so, it, it, you know, and, and, and I don't know if Poe po coined the word, but this, the word tintabulation is in there. It's one of the first uses, uses of it. So that was published. That was the first Poe work published in a textbook. That was in the Literary Reader in 1850. The very next year is the first time that, that The Raven was reproduced, and it was reproduced many, many times thereafter. My favorite poem of, of Poe's, Annabelle Lee, one of these poems of lost loves, as is The Raven, um, first appeared in McGuffey's New High School Reader in 1857. Let me talk about Poe's appearances in post-1850s textbook. The Haunted Palace is, was a poem that Poe wrote separately, but then he incorporated into one of his most famous short stories, The Fall of the House of Usher. That and um, The Philosophy of Composition, which is actually a, a literary critical essay. It's, it's Poe's explanation of how he supposedly wrote The Raven. These appeared in the sixth or classic English reader. The first short story by Poe didn't appear until 1889 in McGuffey's High School Reader, and that was A Descent into the Maelstrom, and that wasn't really the whole thing. Now, of course, after, the, after we get to the 20th century, Poe's fiction dominates more than, than his poetry does. Uh, but during, definitely during the 19th century, it was his poetry more than his prose that was reproduced in textbooks. Okay, I want to move on to my topic. And this is a post text in magazines that were marketed to boys and girls. So I'm going to talk about three magazines. They're all British. First is the Boys Own Magazine, which lasted for about 20 years from 1855 to 1874. Then the Boys Own Paper, which lasted almost 100 years, 1879 to 1967. And the Girls Own Paper, which started the very next year, didn't last quite as long, but still many, many years, 75 years, from 1880 to 1956. Now, again, those of you who, who can see my slides here, if, if you look at, um, look at the top of this page, the, the, the front page from the boys' own paper. Uh, if you look at the images there, so you've got a dog, these are British people, so you've got a cricket bat and you've got a cricket ball, you've got a book, looks like you've got two bunnies there and you've got a black bird. I think that black bird is a raven. Um, and even though these were British, look at the, look at the lead story here. Adventures of a Boston boy among savages. So a lot of American content in, in, the, in these British magazines. I'm gonna have a lot to say about race later on, but, but it's, an, it's an issue even here. Okay, let me move on and talk about the, 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 boys, the boys' own magazine. This was edited by Samuel Beaton and he published five of Poe's works over a three year period. So um, one of Poe's humorous stories, which is based on the Arabian Nights, the 1,002nd one, one tale of Scheherazade appeared in 1855, as did, as did his story Hop Frog, which is really quite interesting because Hop Frog is an incredibly violent story. Um, but, but even till today, violence is somehow more acceptable than what's deemed to be bad language or sexual content. Um, in 1856, the gold bug appeared in Boys Own Magazine, as did A Descent into the Maelstrom. Um, and then Poe's only novel, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, the first part of it, a heavily edited, appeared in, in 1857. So what were the same, what were his editorial goals? The first thing he was trying to do was to teach. The, his, his, uh, his boy readers. So he includes footnotes, um, but he would even tack on morals at times to drive a point home. He was also trying to achieve healthy reading standards. So he cut things out. What were referred to as oaths back then, devil, go to the devil, that he eliminated. Or, and they wouldn't even use the word damn, it would be D then underline, underline N. Of course you knew what it was. 
Beaton cut that out as well. And other changes he made was he would cut things out to speed up the action and to make the plots more riveting. And what's really interesting to me is it kind of foreshadows what happens with the pulp magazines um, in the in the te in the teens and particularly in the twenties and thirties, things like Black Mask, where they wanted just nonstop action, the most bang for the buck. Well, back you know, Beaton was doing that for boys back in the nineteenth century. Okay, let me move on now to um, the, the the boys' own paper and the girls' own paper. Now, both of these were published by the Religious Tract Society. So, of course, there's an emphasis on morality here. And although neither the boys' own paper nor the girls' own paper reprinted the gold book, they both, the, the boys' own paper talked about it all the time, I, I guess assuming that all of their readers had read it. Um, the, in a, a list of recommended reading for girls in the girls' own paper, both the gold bug and a descent into a mount, the maelstrom were included. So the religious tract society through these magazines very much were um, approving of the gold bug and, and descent. Um, okay, now I'm gonna move on to my fourth major topic, which is films and comic books and cartoons. First, biopic, the first film that was based on someone's life was entitled Edgar Allan Poe, except it spelled Poe's middle name wrong. His middle name is A W L A N. But um, thank you. There, there's a there, there's a reason there's a reason for this. Now the 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 director of this film was D W Griffith, who became notorious for his his uh, his film The Birth of the Nation in 1915. But he made a seven minute film in 1909. And film historians think the reason that they got the name wrong is that they were trying to rush out this film to coincide with the 100th anniversary of Poe's birth. It's on YouTube. I would highly recommend it. It's a hoot. Uh, and if you've never seen a silent film, it's just interesting to see it because, of course, they can't say anything. Um, although there, there are subtitles at times, but there are all of these exaggerated <laughs> at times. And even though it's supposed to be a biography of Poe's life, it conflates two things. Poe's writing of the Raven with the death of his wife, Virginia. Now, in real life, those happen two years apart. This film just puts it together as if one was, was, was connected with or related to the other. Um, it's estimated that Poe's texts have inspired more films than any other writers with the exception of William Shakespeare. Now, getting back to the point of view about Poe tending to write short fiction and, and to a certain extent, short poems. A lot of the films made based on Poe's works have been short themselves. Um, and again, that in many cases is perfect for the classroom. And that's actually been a, a, a challenge for uh, filmmakers who want to make Poe films that are feature length. They've either had to um, use a number of Poe's stories and kind of string them together, or they've had to greatly expand on Poe's plots. Okay, I want to move now to um, comic books. And, I, and I, I'm sorry for those of you who are on the phone and cannot see some of these images, because they're really something. Now, Back in, in 2008, it was estimated that there had been over 300 comic books or graphic novels which had been inspired by Poe's work. There have been many, many more since then. I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, but it wouldn't surprise me if there are over 500 now because um, they really seem to be pro proliferating. And the images are really something. So those of you who can see it, this graphic classics one on, on the left there, you've got Poe, he's sweating on his forehead and he's grabbing a, he's grabbing a headstone. A lot of his, a lot of his uh, either speakers in his poems or, or characters, stories are, are you know, lovers mourning a lost love. But look at this other one, Two-Fisted Poe. So you've got Poe dressed in his 19th century garb, 
going up against some organized crime figure from the 1920s and punching him out, quoth the raven, lights out. Um, and in the background, you can see the raven on the other side of a window. Um, let's look at some more of these, or I'll try and describe them as best I can. There have been both close and loose adaptations of Poe's stories, for the most part, um, in, in, in comic books. So the, the classics illustrated, um, they, I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's not Poe's text, but they are very, very faithful, as faithful as they, as they can be. They really try to stick to the letter of Poe's stories as much as possible. And um, they even, they have a biography of Poe at the end. Uh, they have a quiz that you can take. Uh, they even provide some literary analysis and Classics the point that now that you've read this version of it, you should seek out and find the full length version and read it. But other comic book writers have taken all sorts of liberties with Poe's text. This Richard Corbin, the image on the right here, he's done two completely different Fall of the House of Ushers. Have much of anything to do with post stories. It's just kind of a jumping off point for his imagination. And a lot of people, a lot of comic book writers have done that. There's a connection between Poe and Batman. Now, it makes some sense. In the, uh, in the, 18, in the early 1840s, Poe wrote uh, a series of nonfiction pieces called Doings in Gotham, about New York City, of course. Batman is set in Gotham City. But there's a whole series, a whole Batman series called Nevermore. And those of you who, who have these images in front of you, you can see. So it's Batman at, to at the top, then Nevermore, which of course is from the Raven. And then there's actually a Raven perched on top of it. If you can see this image on the left, there's a, a black cat apparently on steroids who is grabbing Batman by the throat. And then behind Batman, there's Poe with a stick, I guess, maybe thinking he's going to hit the black cat. Um, if you look at the image on the right, it comes right from Poe's story, The Pit and the Pendulum. It's Batman who is tied up, and the pendulum is, which, which is you know, very sharp and is, 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 is going to cut him in two unless he's saved somehow, uh, is, 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 is swinging back and forth. Now, there's also a, a figure in a cage, could be Poe, but doesn't really look like Poe. So I don't know about that one. Um, and then there's Edgar Allan Poe's Snifter. I mean, again, I apologize to you. <coughs> see this, these slides, but let me try and describe. So that's when he, those of you who are old enough to remember the cover of the book of Benchley's Jaw, it was um, a girl swimming with very little clothes on, maybe no clothes on, and the shark was coming up from underneath. So on this one, it is Edgar Allan Poe coming up underneath with big sharp like teeth. But if you look at, if you can see it, you can see the descriptions. Inside, there are two comic <coughs> of two of Poe's stories. Then if you can see the image on the right, and if you can, again, I'll try and describe it. Um, so this one is kind of a mashup. So it's the telltale black cask of Usher. So a mashup of the telltale heart, the Cast of Amontillado and the Fall of the House of Usher. They put all those titles together, but it's somehow set in Nazi Germany. So you've got Poe in 19th century garb, punching Hitler out with the Nazi flag in the background. Uh, there's somebody with a Luger who's shooting at Poe apparently. Poe has got a goblin in his hand with some sort of red fluid, maybe it's Blood, maybe it's red wine, it's not very clear, but it gives you a sense of the kind of liberties that, that comic book writers have taken with Poe's text. Okay, let me move on to cartoons. I mentioned Scooby-Doo before, and then of course there's, there's The Simpsons. Uh, Phyllis mentioned at the beginning, I, I, I sometimes do a presentation which is, quote the raven, eat my shorts. 
the life, liberty, and, uh, and, and legacy, literature and legacy of, of Edgar Allan Poe. And then Eat My Shorts comes from Bart Simpson. So um, Simpsons have done all sorts of things with Poe. Um, but the very first Treehouse of Terror was The Whole Raven with Homer as the grieving lover, Marge as Lenore with her pictures on the wall and her hair keeps on going up and up and up. Um, Bart is the raven, and that's the middle image here, if you have it, on perched on the bust of Pallas Athena. And uh, James Earl Jones narrates the, uh, you know, he reads the poem, uh, basically. It's terrific. There, they also did one, the, the Castle of Mont Amontillado, you know, do was one of Homer's words. Um, but Scooby-Doo did a lot with Edgar Allan Poe. If you, if you can see this image on the left here, so in addition to having the TV shows, Scooby-Doo had tie-in comic books. So that's what these two images are here. So in the, the first one, you've got Poe saying nevermore, and you've got Shakespeare saying to be or not to be, you will be the latter. Um, they're both in a, in a library, they're terrorizing um, the heroes from the from the mystery machine, and of course, Shaggy and Scooby are cowering together as these ghosts are doing this. Um, the image all the way to the right, you see, you've got a picture of Poe with a, 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 a quill pen in his hand. You've got a skull um, next to him, and then you have Fred saying in a very pedantic way. Indeed, um, indeed, Shaggy. Uh, in addition to being a poet, Edgar A. Poe uh, was a was a writer who invented what today is called the detective story. So, you know, this is very typical of anything to do with the detective genre that um, earlier detective writers are paid homage to. Um, and of course, because the genre genre goes all the way back to Poe, many times there's some sort of nod to Poe, as we have here. Okay, last thing I want to talk about today is Poe's story, The Gold Book, which was very popular among juvenile readers uh, and was marketed specifically to them. So as I mentioned before, I, I mean, for the first hundred years, it was, it was first published in 1943. It won a contest and Poe po won $100, which for Poe was an awful lot of money, more money he made on anything else in his life. Unfortunately for, for Poe, once he got the $100 prize, all these other newspapers republished it and he never got another dime for it. But he did better than he did with The Raven, which he supposedly only got $9 for. Uh, and that, of course, was republished probably even more than The Gold Book. <coughs> but um, the thing about The Gold Bug is, and, and I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail later, is that without The Gold Bug, just as we wouldn't have Scooby-Doo, we'd have what Dora the Explorer, we wouldn't have Sherlock Holmes, uh, we wouldn't have hard-boiled fiction without Poe. We wouldn't have Treasure Island. We wouldn't have the Pirates of the Caribbean. We wouldn't have anything having to do with treasure maps if it wasn't for Poe's The Gold Book. And um, from early on, it was something that appealed to young readers, particularly young male readers. And um, between 1885 and 1910, so over that 25 year period, there were 11 standalone editions of the Gold Book that were, in, and most of them were marketed specifically to, to children and they were meant to be used in the classroom. So they would include maps, they would include glossaries, they would include suggestions for teachers. During roughly the same period, there were 11 editions of Poe's Tale which mentioned the gold bug in the title, either the gold bug in other tales or the gold bug, the cast of Montiato and the purloined letter, something like that. But again, the name was used because it was such a popular story. Now in 1989, there was a book by Burton Palmer, which really traced all of the illustrations that had done a post text. And at that point in 1989, the gold bug was far and away the, the text by Poe that had been illustrated the most, more than The Raven, more than any of his detective fiction. And, and I think even today that would still be the case. So let me try and explain why The Gold Bug was such a popular story and why it has such appeal to, to young readers. 
it had a unique common, or it has unique combination of elements. Number one, it's a detective story, but it's a detective story which uses cryptography. Poe was a puzzle solver. In fact, in certain magazines that he edited, uh, he would have contests where people would send him coded messages or some sort of puzzles to decipher, and he always was somehow able to do it. People became skeptical. They thought, why is he always able to do it? Does he make these things up himself and then solve them himself? Um, so that had great appeal to readers generally, but particularly the young readers. Secondly, it's an adventure story. It's a treasure hunt. Thirdly, it, it contains this fantasy of the acquisition of the fa fabulous wealth. I mean, what could be better than to discover a treasure chest and become really rich? Fourthly, it's got pirates in it. Finally, and this is where the problems come in. Um, it uses local color. There's a, a black character named Jupiter who is a shadowy presence in the story, but he's also a, 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 a figure of fun in the story. And Poe utilizes a lot of minstrel show um, type humor at Jupiter's, at Jupiter's expense. Um, and I, I need to explain a little bit about, um, about, about race and racial depictions during the 19th century. Poe tried to have it both ways. He tried to appeal to a national audience. So he didn't, he didn't depict slavery very often, even though he was, he was reared in the South uh, and, and he grew up in a family which, uh, which, which owned people. Um, he tried to avoid that because he knew that Northern readers, many of them were against slavery. <laughs> At the same time, um, most people in the United States, whether they were in the North or in the South, had a very low opinion of people of color. And a lot of this was because of the minstrel shows. Um, there were a lot of stereotypes that were, that were, that began on the minstrel shit stage in which the minstrel stage um, proliferated. Um, Jim Crow, that was a character invented by a white man. And the first minstrels were white people who blacked up their face and, and used kind of elaborate makeup to, to appear in, 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 a, in a certain way. And they used a lot of exaggerated ge gestures and they used a lot of wordplay, what we would call malapropisms today, using the wrong word in the, in the right word in the wrong situation or the wrong word in the, in the wrong situation. Um, and uh, T.D. Rice, by the way, he had another character that he invented. It was Uncle Sam. So think about that for a second. Um, those of you who can see the, the, the image here, I just love this. I mean, in the story, the gold bug, which is a real beetle that's found, supposedly has markings on it, which look like a skull. Well, this artist here has somehow created a, a, a skull-like beetle, but also it looks a little bit like Poe to me. I don't know if you agree. Okay. So let me talk about these, these reasons why the story was so appealing. So the first thing is, is the use of detection and then deciphering certain things. So there's a treasure map that's found. It, happens, it turns out to be uh, Captain Kidd's treasure map. So it dates way back to the uh, to, 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 you know, hundreds, hundreds of years. But it's a map and code. And so in order to find the treasure, the code has to be cracked in some way. Now, those of you who can see uh, the images here, fun fact, the image on the right is by Maud Humphreys. That's Humphrey Bogart's mother. She was an artist, an illustrator. Second thing is, and I'm going to have several images about the treasure hunt. Um, so if you look at this image on the left, if you have it, you've got, um, you, you've got Legrand, who is the detective figure. They're setting out on the treasure hunt and he's got the gold bug that they found on a string. The narrator is there with the top hat and then kind of behind him, but you can't see him. And I'm gonna say more about that, is Jupiter. Jupiter is an ex-slave. So there's Poe trying to avoid the problem of slavery. And yet he is very much a servant and he refers to William Legrand as Massa Will. So Poe is trying to have it both ways. 
The image on the right, they take the treasure hunt pretty far here, so much so that one of the three characters has a pistol. So, and the pistol is not actually mentioned in the story. Here are some more, another kind of adventurous moment in the story is that in order to follow the steps on the treasure map, someone has to climb up a very tall tree, find a skull that has been nailed to a branch of the tree, and then drop something heavy through one of the eye holes of the skull. Uh, and if you look at the, the image all the way on the right, you can kind of see that happening there. Um, Legrand kind of perversely has Jupiter drop the gold bug itself through one of the eye holes. Now, if you look at the image on the left, if you can see it, we can't see Jupiter's face at all, but we can see the skull very clearly. The image in the middle by, Ar by Arthur Betcher, a very realistic image. Um, uh, the image on the right, um, Jupiter looks a lot like Uncle Remus, and then it's maybe that's not surprising because that's the time that Uncle Remus' stories were, were being were very popular, were being published. Okay, another reason the story is popular is this fantasy of acquiring fabulous wealth. So, um, and you're gonna see, because there'll be several images like that, those of you can see the image, but there are a lot of common elements. So there's the lantern, there's the treasure chest, of course, uh, there are tools, and there's either a skull or there's a, uh, there are skeletons. Now, in some of these images, you'll actually see the gold and the jewel. So that the image on the left here, there's a character who's actually plunging his arms into, into the treasure. Um, that does happen in the story, but it's Jupiter who does it in the story. Here, it's one of the white characters. Um, the image in the, on the right has got two complete skeletons. Um, I, I guess to you know to make it more macabre, you know, I, you know, if they've been buried for hundreds of years, you wouldn't think that the skeletons would be connected the way they would be for an anatomy class. But uh, it has a certain effect. Um, can I? Yeah. The the these next two images I think are two of the most interesting of any images that have been done of Poe. Uh, of Poe stories, and they're and and so if you look at the, the the one on the left here, look how young the narrator and Legrand are. They look like they're fifteen years old or something like that. Again, this is I think an attempt to appeal to a certain kind of reader. Now, see, so they're looking inside the treasure chest. In the foreground, half in light and half in shadow, you have a complete skeleton. But look behind the skull. There's Jupiter, looking very mysterious, very, very sinister in the background there. And I, I'm gonna get to portrayals of Jupiter in, in a little while. The image on the right is completely unique by Harry Clark. Most images focus in on the treasure. Here, we're pulled way back as if this is a bird's eye camera eye shot. And it, it kind of stresses how isolated this location is. And the, the treasure seems to be Tim seems to be glowing or emitting light, which is actually the way it's described in the story. And Jupiter is jumping for joy now that they found the gold. Here are a couple more images of the treasure. You've got the two on the left here. You've got the two white characters are pulling the treasure out of the hole. You see the skull there, as so often is the case. Look at the image on the right from Fritz Eichenberg. Um, again, all of these things that we see before, tools, the lantern, the skull, there's a dog in the store, Wolf, who's a, who's a Newfoundland. Um, all of these characters look somewhat, the human characters look somewhat animalistic, um, and it kind of fits in with their greed as they, as they look at the, at, at the treasure. But note how similar Jupiter and Wolf look here. You know, it, it fits in with a certain way in which Jupiter is portrayed in the story and in other illustrations. Okay, let me get to pirates. Now, as I mentioned in the story, the weapons, there are no swords or daggers mentioned in the story. The only weapon is a mattock. Legrand theorizes that Captain Kill Kid probably used a mattock, which is, which is a, a kind of tool um, you know, and would, have, would have killed the sailors who buried the treasure with him, so only he would know the location of the treasure. But if you, if you look at this image on the left, if you have it, 
Um, this is one of these standalone editions of, of the Gold Bug from 1899. So you've got Captain Kidd, he's got a sword in his arms, he's, there's a sword on the sand in front of him, and then there's another pistol in his waistband. The image that's just a hoot to me is the one in the middle. Now, those of you who, are, who have ever gone to either Disneyland or Disney World and gone on the Pirates of the Caribbean, this is it right here. Look at that. With the skull and crossbones, as you, as you go into the Pirates of the Caribbean, the skull and crossbones talks to you and says, rough seas ahead, matey. And then if you look at the, the figure of Captain Kidd here, now first let's talk about the weapons. So he's got a pistol in both hands. He's got a sword in between his teeth and he's got an assortment of pistols and daggers in his waistband. But he's also walking in a kind of unsteady way like Johnny Depp's Captain Jack Sparrow. Johnny Depp supposedly based it on Keith Richard, that portrayal. Well, it seems to be anticipated here back in 1894 by the artist Minutes. Um, one more image here is uh, by, by Rackham is of Kid killing one of the sailors, this time with a dagger. I don't know about you, if those of you can see the image, um, Captain Kidd looks a lot like Ronald Reagan to me for some reason. It does. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna get to this whole issue of, uh, of Jupiter's portrayal. Tony Morrison, the, the African-American novelist, Nobel Prize winner, wrote a wonderful book in 1992 called Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination, in which she talks about classic white American literature. And one of the things she talks about is the, the way that black characters are on the margin of these literary works. And her argument is if we, if we acknowledge this and we read these characters into the fiction, it, they, the fiction actually becomes more, even more interesting than it already is. Now, what I find fascinating and in keeping with Morrison is how so many of these images from the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century depict Jupiter in a, in a similar kind of way, in the shadows. Now, all three of these images come from, I have a copy of it right here, the Canterbury Classic Edition uh, for, for textbook use. You know, this is one that's got a treasure map, it's got a glossary, it's got instructions for teachers. So Whitney is the, JC, uh, GC Whitney is the artist here. Look, in every one of these images, we can't see Jupiter. So the one on the left here, the narrator, he's the one with the mustache, he's in front of Jupiter so we can't see him. In the, in the image in the center, Jupiter's in the background, so he's in shadow, whereas the two white characters are, are illuminated. And then in, in the image all the way on the right, Jupiter's holding the lantern, while the two white characters are being illuminated by it. So of course, Jupiter is in the dark. Here's some more images. Um, there's a point in the story and it, it fits in with this minstrel show, show type humor where they're digging and digging for the treasure and they're not finding it. The grand gets very mad and he realizes what happened. He realizes that Jupiter has confused his right from his left and has dropped the gold bug through the wrong eye hole of the skull. So he accosts <coughs> Jupiter. So if you look at the image on, on the, the left, you know, Jupiter's eyes are very, very wide. This is right from the minstrel stage. Now, if you look at the image in the center, <laughs> look at how Legrand and the narr narrator are dressed with, a, with, a, with top hats on as they go out to dig for treasure. Meanwhile, Jupiter, again, looks very much like an Uncle Remus figure here. The figure all the way on the right, now this goes back to Jupiter and the tulip tree with the skull, but this is Whitney again. This is, once again, the Canterbury Classics one, and no Jupiter's reaction, the wide eyeballs upon beholding the skeleton. The last example I'm going to talk about is a multi-volume set called Journeys Through Bookland which was edited by, by an educator, a PhD named Charles Sylvester. And he did two different versions of it. One in 1909, which I believe had 10 volumes, and one in 1922, which I believe had nine volumes. The gold bug was included in both versions. 
And the same scenes from the story were illustrated and the same captions were used. But for some reason, different artists were used. So in um, 1909, it was George uh, Ververka, or I, I'm not sure whether that's, whether the W is pronounced as a V or not. Um, in 1922, it was Louis Grell. But if you look carefully, those of you can see it, both of these Jupiters are right from the minstrel stage. Look, it's like he's got makeup around his mouth, the white mouth to accentuate the blackness of his, uh, of, of his, of his face. And again, the gestures, the exaggerated gestures. Jupiter on the right beholding the treasure and then Jupiter on the left seeing the skull for the first time. So my point is that in addition to students being taught how to read, students were also being taught about racial hierarchy, particularly racial hierarchy in the United States. And at that time, people didn't see a problem with this. As I mentioned earlier, the Religious Tract Society endorsed the gold bar, didn't see anything immoral or wrong with it. Similarly, one of these standalone, one of these um, editions of, of the gold bug with other stories designed for children, designed to be used in the classroom, the 1912 graded classic series advertised itself as, as being entirely free from objectionable matter. But what we have to keep in mind is that the gold bug became extremely popular at the time that Jim Crow was at its zenith. So, Reconstruction comes to an end at the end of the 1870s. Things get progressively worse um, till we reach the 1890s, which was sometimes called the Nadir. That's when there are all sorts of grandfather clauses. Um, the, the first two decades of the 20th century, things are worse rather than getting better. And all of the controversy today about the Confederate monuments, the vast majority of the Confederate monuments were not in the 19th century. They are erected early in the 20th century, many of them by the daughters of the Confederacy. And the daughters of the Confederacy were the ones who really promoted the lost cause myth, this notion that the Civil War was not about slavery, but the Civil War was about some sort of dignified type, type of hero. The other thing about the daughters of the Confederacy is they supported the second rise of the Ku Klux Klan at the end of the 19-teens and throughout the 1920s. Okay, just wanna share my source with you. Um, great articles here by Jordan uh, Costanza, uh, another by um, uh, uh, Ken Petzl. Um, so, uh, most of what I got about Poe and, and children's education comes from Costanza. The, the, uh, the part of this talk about, uh, about the, the magazines, uh, a good deal of it comes from um, Petzold's piece. Um, I greatly recommend Thomas Inga's The Incredible Mr. Poe, comic book adaptations of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, uh, 1943 to 2007. Um, if you're looking for any information about Poe, if you're looking for all of Poe's works, if you're looking for criticism on Poe, if you're looking for fun facts, go to uh, EAP, or I, I'm sorry, that should be EAPO. I got that wrong there, EAPO.org. It's the, it's the website of the, um, the Edgar Allan Poe Society, which is um, created and maintained by Jeffrey Savoy. Those two essays that I mentioned are published in the, um, uh, in, in the uh, Edgar Allan Poe Review, which is edited by Barbara Cantalupo. And Travis Montgomery is the uh, secretary of the Edgar Allan Poe Society. And Phyllis already mentioned my book, but I'll, I'll shamelessly plug, plug my own book, um, Edgar Allan Poe and his 19th century American counterparts. I do talk about the, about the gold bug there and I'll shamelessly uh, plug another book for you. Uh, let me see if I can stop sharing the screen. And this is a new book. It's an African-American novel from the earliest 20th century uh, called Hager's Daughter. It's really the first African-American detective novel. So it's, a, it's published by Broadview Press, um, retails in book form for $18.95, but you can get it as a PDF for $12.95.
And if you go to Broadview's website and you put in the code Hopkins with a small, that's the author of Pauline Hopkins, Hopkins with a small age 25, you'll get 25% off. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Every time that you have spoken about Poe, I've learned not only about Poe, but about, like you say, comic books in England in the 1800s for women, for girls. Um, mm -hmm. And the minstrels, the, the whole thing has never been um, explored, you know, you know, that, and I just have to ask you, did he have children? No, Poe had no children. But he wrote for young people, right? Would you say? Well, he did not um, deliberately. You know, during his, during his lifetime, he wasn't specifically writing for children because the concept of children's literature didn't really exist yet. Shortly after he died, children's education kicks into high gear. Okay. Poe is, is used by uh, several uh, textbook editors. Do you think some of the books now would be edited because of the racial undertones? And also- That's a, a very interesting question. I mean, I, I haven't specifically looked for it. I mean, the, the, the Canterbury Classics edition of the Gold Buck, which is uh, it does not reproduce any of the um, exaggerated dialect that Juper uses or the malapropisms. Um, he's, he's presented in, um, I don't know if you can see the way Jupiter is depicted here, um, but he's, he, you know, they avoid that because things, things have I was just wondering. changed since, uh, since the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. Thank you for answering. Are there other questions? Sorry, um, I, it, first of all, it was so interesting and just fascinating. And it made me think of, um, I think this was in the third or fourth grade in the 1940s when I was introduced to Edgar Allan Poe and I, it was uh, around Halloween and it was the Raven and all, you know, and. It's so interesting because I really remember that uh, vividly. And I don't remember much of that time. <laughs> <laughs> and when you were commenting on all this, I mean, I, it was fascinating. Thank you so much. I look forward to pursuing it further. I look forward to your next talk here on your new book. That sounds fascinating. And how did you come to to this kind of book that you're writing. Yeah. It has well, nothing I, to do with Poe. I'm sorry? I know you, you've always written about Poe. This is completely different. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, I do a lot of work in detective fiction, but I do work in African-American fiction. So Hager's Daughter is perfect because it's, it's both African-American and, it's, and it's, uh, it's a story which among other things, um, is a detective story. Well, it sounds fascinating. I thank you so much. It was fabulous as usual. And yeah, and I, if, if anyone is interested, we're actually going to have a virtual book signing for, uh, <laughs> for, for, for Hager's daughter. Um, I can send the information to Phyllis. Uh, you'll need to register ahead of time, but you're certainly welcome to join us. That's going to be on uh, this coming Wednesday, uh, February 10th, um, from, four, uh, from four to five, my time in Texas, so from five to six, your time in New Jersey. Wow, that's wonderful. I, how do you have a virtual one? Can you just tell me? Well, it's an oxymoron, isn't it? You can't actually sign the book, so you gotta air sign it, kind of like air kisses. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck to you with the book, with everything. You are so sweet in, in, in coming and in, in giving us such information because, like I say, it's not only Edgar Allan Poe. You've exposed us to so much more with every mm -hmm. one of your talks. 
So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, all of you.